session, Susan Lightman will give us an update on the NIST PNT profile request for information. Okay, hello, I'm Suzanne Lightman from NIST, and I'm going to talk about NIST's work uh, on positioning navigation and timing. I'm clarifying that I am talking from the point of view of the ITL, the Information Technology Lab, and not from the point of view of our physics labs, which has other issues uh, that they will, other work that they will be doing on PNT in the coming months and years. So, P so the first I'm going to talk about the PNT itself and its purpose and scope to give you an idea of what we're trying to do and what we think our responsibilities are. So the Executive Order 13905, which is known as the PNT order, was placed at, sent out in February 12th, 2020, and is entitled, as you can read, Strengthening National Resilience Through Responsible Use of Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Services. It was basically developed and issued because, as you can see here, there's such widespread adoption of PNT services that the disruption or manipulation of these services could have a widely adverse effect. And people and organizations may have adverse effects and not have thought about what could happen if PNT services are disrupted. It also was developed with the idea that you wanted to present, prevent other organizations from undertaking activities that might unknowingly disrupt PNT services for other organizations. So 13905 concentrates on what they call responsible use, which they mean as deliberate risk-informed use of PNT services. They also, it's also concentrated on how to ensure that there is minimal impact to either national security, economy, public health, or critical functions of the federal government, as well as the functioning of critical infrastructure. Now, NIST has some responsibilities under this, and I'm going to concentrate just on the cybersecurity activities. So under this, NIST has been tasked to create a profile based on the cybersecurity framework that's due within one year, which would be February 12th, 2021. Other agencies could then use that profile to create sector-specific profiles in ordering to help other sectors enhance their use of PNT in a secure and responsible manner. The profiles are intended to be used both in the public and private sector. NIST's objectives in this is to provide a single foundational profile to support a wide range of stakeholders on the responsible use of PNT. And I know that some of you are looking at this and thinking, well, profile what? And I'm going to get into that. And another group of you are thinking, responsible use what? And I'm going to get into that. But I will say that the PNT profile's focus is on cybersecurity. And it's supposed to lay a groundwork for the sector-specific agencies, such as energy, transportation, uh, agriculture, et cetera, to fulfill their requirements to create sector-specific profiles. And we'll get into all of what that means. In order to do this, NIST is planning to engage with our, in fact have, engage with the primary stakeholders, both public and private since a PNT profile is only useful as long as it meets the needs of those who are going to use it. We're focusing on critical infrastructure in this case, uh, the owners operate the electricity grid, communication, infrastructure, transportation, agriculture, weather, and emergency response sections, among others. Space would also probably be one of those. And we were planning to leverage the NIST cybersecurity framework to develop and issue this foundational PNT profile. I want to be clear what is our scope. We are not responsible for issuing a profile that has to do with the space segment, the GPS, or the GNSS itself. We are really dealing with people who are using those PNT services to provide their own activities. So we've been involved in developing this PNT profile, and we've done a lot of work to date in our effort to be done by February. 
It's a very short time frame. We issued a request for information in May and we received those responses in July. During that open RFI, we did a virtual webinar to familiarize people with what NIST was planning to do. We then, just at the beginning of this year, released an annotated outline describing the contents of what will be in the PNT profile. And just last week, the 15th and 16th, we issued, we did a PNT webinar that was comprised of a comprehensive update and then live talkback sessions to further inform and enhance the development of PNT profile. So there are a couple of definitions that I've been using that I probably should talk about. One is what do we mean by PNT services? PNT services are the capabilities that provide a reference to calculate or augment the calculation of longitude, latitude, altitude, or transmission of time or frequency data, or any combination of those things. NIST is using the term PNT systems to mean those systems that an organization owns that reach out to PNT services to get the information in ordering to calculate these activities. So for example, we're not talking about the GPS itself, but we are talking about a pipeline that may have a GPS receiver that it uses to calculate time and synchronize time along its pipeline, for example. The profile, which is set in the EO, is set as a description of responsible use, which in this view means aligned to standards, guidelines, and sector-specific requirements which are selected for a particular system to address the potential disruption or manipulation of PNT services and the effect it would have on that system. We try, as we try in all of our development processes, to be open, transparent, and collaborative. The profile will hopefully provide guidance to organizations on how to, one, identify what systems they have that are dependent on PNT, identify if they're using or should use an appropriate PNT source, help them figure out how to detect disturbances and manipulation of PNT services, not so they can do anything about what is happening to the service itself, but so that they can protect themselves as they rely on uh, PNT data, and manage the risk to these systems. And by systems, we mean the PNT systems under the control of the organization. We received a fairly large number of responses for what is a fairly specialized discussion, uh, 39 responses, the majority of which, as you can see, came from the private sector. The key themes we had were, one, there was an agreement that there was a significant amount of dependencies, both for uh, business needs and for, more specifically, for actual functioning of systems. For example, the precise timing needed for the electrical grid, uh, the precise uh, navigation information that was necessary for ships at sea. The biggest two potential disruptions that we saw were manipulation and, sp and spoofing and a denial of signals, whether that's natural or technical. The impact of, dis of disruptions landed into two Points. There were those who said that this would lead to a degradation of services and those who said that they were actually at operational risk of not being able to continue to function. Mitigation strategies, well, there were quite a few of those. Uh, monitoring use of alternate sources so that there could be a comparison to see if there were any kind of issues or in the case of a disruption being able to carry over so temporarily they don't have access to a PNT source, but that wouldn't matter because they were able to keep a fair amount of operational uh, precision for a certain amount of time, or simply accepting the risk that in fact they may have these disruptions or they may have spoofing and they felt that Either they had no other options, or in fact, they had designed their systems to continue functioning if all of this, the PNT services were just not available. 
We heard from a number of sectors, energy, aviation, communications, public safety, automotive, agriculture, um, energy. We also heard from underwater drilling, which was an interesting response. So far, we're working on the following developmental part, pro, timeline. October 20th, 2020, the draft profile uh, release for 30-day public comment. In November 2020, uh, we had the profile. I'm sorry, these got a little confused here. I'm going to talk not to this slide, which is actually incorrect. In October 2020, we released, uh, the, the EO was released. In May of 2020, as you said, we had the RFI. In September, we had the annotated outline, and we are now planning in October of 2020 to do a draft profile release for 30-day public comment. This will be a draft document that is set out in a profile format, and we will be following that up with a webinar as well as a uh, outlet for written comments. And then finally, we are working up obviously to the February 2021 when we will do the final profile issuance. So let me give you, now I've been talking about profiles for quite a while now, and for those of you who are not familiar with NIST, you might ask, what do we mean by profile? Well, a profile comes out of the NIST cybersecurity framework. The NIST cybersecurity framework was developed for another executive order. And when we were asked to develop another cybersecurity framework, we all sat around at NIST and thought, well, there's a lot of frameworks in cybersecurity. Why do we need another one? And it was decided that what we needed was something that would allow an entire organization to have a way to talk about cybersecurity that made sense whether you were in the C-suite, whether you were an operational manager, or whether you were actually an IT security technical person. The purpose of the cybersecurity framework is to allow organizations to begin with their business objectives and their perceptions of risk, and to be able to map that through activities all the way down so that they can look at a particular system and say, these are the particular controls that we need. It is always risk-based and it's meant to be a living document. We're currently on version 1.2, 1.1, I think, and are working on version 1.2. It was designed in the midst of probably one of our most uh, cooperative activities. We had a series of, I think it was five workshops over the space of about eight months. Uh, we had thousands of people attend those workshops to try and develop this. And what came out was the cybersecurity framework, and it is composed of three parts. One is the core. This is where there are a series of cybersecurity outcomes, which are organized in a hierarchy, and they can be aligned to more detailed guidance and controls. So in a sense, you start, an organization starts by saying, this is what I want my cybersecurity outcomes to be based on my business objectives. And that will eventually, through the cybersecurity framework, lead them as far down as they want to go until they're talking about individual controls and individual systems. The other part is a series of implementation tiers. These are not maturity levels. They simply provide a qualitative measure of how organizational cybersecurity risk management is being implemented. And finally, a profile. A profile is the actual alignment of requirements, objectives, risk appetites, and resources using the desired outcomes of the framework core. So this is a sort of, of look at the core. It has five functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. And all cybersecurity activities fall into one of those five functions. Then within the functions are a series of categories, 
And then within the categories are a series of subcategories. The subcategories and categories are actually quite flexible. We have seen implementations where people have added categories, taken away categories, added in new subcategories, all to fit their particular needs. Once an organization has determined this and has gone through its categories and subcategories, it develops what's known as a profile. And a profile is, this is what we want. This is where we want to be. In terms of cybersecurity writ large, they can also do a what's known as an as-is profile, where they map out the same categories, subcategories, but they say this is where they are. And then you would have a differentiation between the two. The nice thing about the cybersecurity profiles, uh, as we've heard from various people, various organizations who have used them, is it can allow mapping to the point where you can also assign dollar values to that controls. So you can get a sense of how much your, your resources are getting you in terms of cybersecurity goals. If you're interested in cybersecurity frameworks, we do have several examples out. Uh, there is a manufacturing profile, which is currently coming out in a new version, uh, hopefully within the next couple of months. There's the cybersecurity framework for smart grid profile and the maritime profile, which is uh, for bulk liquid transports. Each of these was designed slightly differently. The manufacturing profile is a high level profile that is designed to be used by anybody in the manufacturing, <coughs> excuse me, in the manufacturing sector. <coughs> Therefore, it's talking very broadly about what you could do, what your interests are, et cetera. It's made to be used by very small organizations or very large, those who are very sophisticated in cybersecurity and those who are not as sophisticated. The smart grid profile uh, was made to be used by the electric sector. So it is very conscious of sector requirements, the need for reliability, the fact that the electricity sector is very integrated with each other, and you need to constantly be, care be careful of reliability and resiliency. The bulk liquid transport profile is about a particular part of a particular sector and its particular concerns. So that gives you a better idea of what a profile is. Now I'm going to go over what we've done so far in the PNT profile, which is the issuance of an annotated outline. So the annotated outline started off with the idea of what could possibly go wrong. It turns out a lot. Um, a lot of critical infrastructure is dependent on PNT data and services. And there's a lot of reliance on a single PNT service provider, which leads to increased impact or increased threat, which leads to increased risk. Because if so many people are dependent on a single point of failure and that system fails, then it's going to have enormous implications for the country and the economy. So again, NIST is using the CSF to create a risk-based cybersecurity approach. Again, this is, facilitates responsible use of systems that form or use PNT data. These are the systems, again, I will specify, owned by the organizations who are pulling from PNT sources. And the annotated outline is, also provides insight into the direction that NIST is going based on its analysis of the uh, RFI responses and the information we've received back in other ways. So the PNT profile, the target of the PNT profile is organizations that use PNT services. Uh, the managers, the risk managers, procurement, mission and business owners and researchers. One of the advantages again of the CSF is it does provide a way to talk about cybersecurity risk that is accessible both to those who are non-technical and those who are technical. So the purpose of the profile is to provide guidance. And I want to be really clear about this. A profile is not a checklist. It is not a compliance document. 
it's not a uh, take you by the hand and give you the recipe for how to do this. It is advisory, not regulatory, and it does require that the organizations who are using it actually invest time in understanding and accessing their own risk. The objectives of the PPNT profile are based on what NIST determined based on the RFI were the most pressing issues. One, organizations should identify systems that form or use PNT data. They should identify the PNT sources they use. They should be able, through the use of the profile, to get to the point where they can share information about common threats and mitigation strategies, either within their sector, like through an ISAC, or with their partners. To protect PNT services, and when we mean protect PNT services, I want to specify we are not talking about doing anything for the PNT services. What we mean by this is that part of responsible use for an organization is not to do activities that might disrupt the PNT services for other organizations around them. For example, if you accidentally um, disrupt other people's signals. Detect anomalies and outages. To try, uh, this is to build a capacity to understand when the PNT services are not available or when the PNT service, the signal that you're getting may be compromised. And to assess and manage the risk in the event of a PNT degradation or outage. Besides the fact you're not getting PNT data and that the system that's pulling in that data may not be able to get it, what else will be impacted by that disruption? And finally, to be able to respond in a manner consistent with risk management principles. In other words, once you've determined that there is a disruption, the profile is going to help you develop plans for how to respond and recover from those disruptions. The CFS enables the executive order by allowing you to ID PNT dependencies, uh, figure out what your PNT sources are, detect disturbances and manipulations, and manage the risk. And part of the detect disturbances and manipulation is, of course, the information sharing that could then allow much faster response to PNT source threats. So what exactly will you get when you use the PNT profile? Well, the first thing you will get is that you will, at the end of the implementation of your PNT profile, is to be able to know that you are using PNT systems responsibly and to understand the risks that you have when you use those PNT uh, sources. One of the things that we have realized in discussing with organizations that use PNT sources is that one of they have not really traced how far reaching the impact is of the disruption of those sources on their own activities. They may be able to tell you what the disruption is on their particular activity that actually pulls in the information from the PNT source, but they may not be able to tell you how it cascades out. The profile will also help you do that and also to prioritize it in accordance with business or mission objectives. As I said, this is not a compliance document or a checklist. Your risk as an organization determines your activities. It should also allow you to connect with recommended policies and procedures for acquisition, integration, and deployment of these systems. So the annotated outline that's currently up, and you can pull it down, I'll have the website at the end of this presentation, highlights the risk management overview, resiliency, or resilience, which is a key theme in the executive order, capabilities overview, the policies and procedures, some of the technical capabilities, and the PNT profile with its functions of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So here we have some examples of this. 
identify systems using PNT services. Uh, we would like to see well-characterized application requirements, documentation and calibration, scheduled maintenance, and regular verification and validation of components. When we say identify appropriate PNT services, we mean integration of diverse and or complementary PNT sources, if possible or if reasonable, documentation and calibration of the systems that form PNT data. This means they pull in PNT information and then they create something else and send it back out. For example, um, they may pull in location data and then use that for positioning or navigation. Detection of disturbances and risk management. So that's really uh, the end of my presentation. To get more information, you can go to www.nist.gov forward slash PNT. That's where we keep all of our information. Uh, you can pull down the annotated outline. You can also go on to our mailing list so that you will get more information wherever we have uh, activities going on. And for questions or comments, you can send them to pnt-eo at list.nist.gov.